Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Gopi Janna Valaba Girivana Dari Gopi Janna Valaba Girivana Dari Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Gopi Janna Valaba Girivana Dari Gopi Janna Valaba Girivana Dari Nandana, but it doesn't run, Jamunatira Vanachari Jaya Radha Manhava Kunjavi Hari Jaya Radha Manhava Jabi Hari Gopi Janna Valaba Gidivana Nari Gopi Janna Valaba Jamuna Tira Vana Chari 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 J
अनंत गुरु वैश्य मुनि की जाय नमचार्य शिल हरिदास स्टाकर की जाय इसका फाउंडर चार्य शिल बाबाद की जाय प्रेम से कहो श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य भगवान चरण ऋषि वैद्य के लाल हर स्वस्थ को बाटे मुनि की जाय श्री श्री वाला कृष्ण को गोपनीय श्याम को वालेकुम गिरि योगदान की जाय शिव नाम नाम की जाय श्री माया पुनाव दाम की जाय गंगा माई की जाय जमुन माई की जाय तुलसी देवी की जाय भक्ति देवी की जाय समवेद वक्त मुनि की जाय Transcendental Book Distribution Ki Jai, Hari Nam Sankirtan Ki Jai, Go Pim Hamdi, All Glory to the Devotees, 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 Shri Shri Guru and Shri Gauranga. So this evening we're reading the Bhagavad Gita as it is, Chapter 9, Most Confidential Knowledge. Here it says, Attaining the Supreme. <laughs> chapter, yeah, it says it's chapter 9, but it says he attained the Supreme. Wow. <laughs> they made a little mistake there. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. This is text number 2, one of my favorite verses, and a very famous verse in the Bhagavad Gita. Did you say the same thing, attaining the Supreme? I have a, a different edition. Yeah. Yeah. Raja Vijay Raja Guryam Pavitram Vidam Uttamam Pratyaksha Bhagavan Dharamam Susukam Kartam Avyayam Go ahead, Chad. Yeah. Raja Vijay Raja Guryam Pavitam idam utamam Pratikshavagamam dharmam Susakam kartam avyam Rajavidya The king of education Rajaguyam The king of confidential knowledge Pavitram The purest Idam This utamam Transcendental Pratiksha by direct experience, avagamam, understood, dharmyam, the principle of religion, susukam, very happy, kardum, to execute, avyayam, everlasting. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, Yilvavavad ki jai. This knowledge is the king of education, the most secret of all secrets. It is the purest knowledge and because it gives direct perception of the self by realization. It is the perfection of religion. It is everlasting and it is joyfully performed. The cherry on top of the cake. Purport. This chapter of Bhagavad Gita is called the king of education because it is the essence of all doctrines and philosophies explained before. Among the principal philosophers in India are Gautama, Kanada, Kapila, Yagyavakya, Sadhirya, and Vaishvanava. Should have brought my, I, now I have a, a magnifying glass. I should have brought, should have brought. <laughs> And finally, there are Vyasadev, the author of the Vedanta Sutra. So there is no dearth of knowledge in the field of philosophy or transcendental knowledge. Now the Lord says that this ninth chapter is the king of all such knowledge, the essence of all knowledge that it can be derived from the study of the Vedas and different kinds of philosophy. It is the most confidential because confidential or transcendental knowledge involves understanding the difference between the soul and the body. And the king of all confidential knowledge culminates in devotional service. Generally, people are not educated in this confidential knowledge. They are educated in external knowledge. So we'll 
gradually go through this uh, this purport. It's a long one, actually. Very nice, but maybe we'll just go through it gradually. Om yana tamananda syaginanda na salaka chaksha malitam jena tajma shri gireve na mukum kuru dvachala Pungunung hai te grim yet kripa telaham bande shigirum dinatanam, vanchika puti vischa, kripa sindu devacha puritanam, pav and avio vaisnavio namonamaha, jai shi kishna chaitanya pravanichananda, shared by tigadana, shivasati go or vakturanda, hare kishna, hare kishna, kishna kishna, hare hare, hare ram, hare ram, ram ram, hare hare. Throughout the world, people are very much in the illusion that they are the material body. It's a major problem throughout the world. Uh, But this is the, the first teaching that Krishna gives in the Bhagavad Gita. Dehi no smanyatha dehi. That the soul is going through this body from boyhood to youth to old age, and the body is going to die. But the soul, the soul is going to continue according to our, according to our karma, according to uh, how we live this life, or the architects of our future. So the the soul is not going to die, even with this virus. It's it's not going to kill the soul. The soul is going to continue. And according to how we live this life, we're creating our our future. So as it's mentioned here, Prabhupada just mentioned here that the the goal is actually to engage in devotional service. This is the the natural position of the soul is to is to serve Krishna. Now, in this life, people are in this illusion that they are this body, and because of this, they're thinking they're this body. They're thinking that there's many things that are very valuable in connection to this body. But Krishna says in the or actually it's in the. Yeah, Krishna said to Lord Brahma, "Retirtam yet the pa, retirtam yet the pa da." It's slipping my mind now, but Krishna said to to Lord Brahma that whatever appears to be of value but has no connection to me, know that to be my illusory energy, that reflection which appears in darkness. So if things that we consider to be valuable isn't connected to Krishna, then that actually binds us to the material world. And whatever we think is of value, but it's con- in connection to Krishna, then we get we get liberated from this material entanglement. So, uh, and Krishna explains, and the Vaishnavas explain the guru, sadhus, they explain what is actually valuable. And especially in this Kali Yuga, what is most valuable is the chanting of the holy name of Krishna. So therefore, uh, it stated, Hari Nama, Hari Nama, Hari Nama, Eva Kayulam. Kalao Nasteva, Nasteva Gachanya that there is no other way in this age of Kali to attain perfection than to chant the names of Krishna. And uh, the reason that is, is because the name of Krishna and Krishna are non-different. Nama Chintamani Krishna, Chaitanya Rasa Vigra, Purno Sura Nityam Vigyam, that the name of Krishna uh, is is purifying. It's very purifying. Because the name of Krishna is Krishna. It's not different. So Krishna is the most pure. So however we come in contact with Krishna, 
we get purified. So therefore this, uh, it's, it's recommended in this age, the age of Kali, the, the, the degraded dark age of Kali, that one chant the holy name to purify the soul. In this impure state, uh, people are very dissatisfied, frustrated. But when one becomes pure, then one experiences the, the pleasure that is natural for the soul. Yeah, just as it's stated here, Krishna says that this process is, is joyfully performed. But we have to be educated. And therefore, Krishna, he comes in and gives us this, this king of education, the Raja Vijay, the king of education. There's so much uh, knowledge out there in this world, so many universities, so many courses people can take, they can study so much, but they can't study about what is most important, which is the soul. Actually, there's a few places where they can. We have our Bhaktivedanta College in uh, Belgium. And there's a devotee here in America, Garuda, he teaches the Bhagavad Gita in his course. So there, there's very few places where one could get the, the king, the highest education. Uh, but Prabhupada, he wanted that this uh, knowledge be distributed everywhere so that people can get this real, this real education. When he was in Boston, he was given a class where he was speaking to some students, a good number of students, actually. And he was speaking about this, about the soul, the eternality of the soul, about Krishna. And he said, why isn't there a course in this university where you could learn about the soul. Socrates, who was the, uh, practically the, the father of modern philosophy, he had a very firm understanding of the existence of the soul. And he was teaching it to his uh, students. But the leaders of, of Greece, they didn't like this, so they told him, listen, you, you have to stop this. It's uh, going against our grain, so please, you have to stop this. He, he wouldn't stop. And it was such a authoritarian government, democratic, by the way. <laughs> they said, if you don't stop, we're going we're gonna to kill you. you. He said, you can do what you like, but I'm going to... He had such high integrity. Even he was ready to give his life. But he's going to continue teaching as he, as he understood was the truth. So they said, well, okay, then when, when, when it's all over, do you want to be buried or burned or what do you want? You know what he said? He said, you'll have to catch me. <laughs> Because he knew, uh, you can't burn me. It's amazing. Prabhupada was very fond of Socrates because he, he didn't have a guru, he didn't have any shastra. But he was a realized soul, ready, even willing to die for his understanding of what was truth. And he did. It's amazing. <laughs> but now, throughout the world, you can't hear about what such an intelligent person understood, realized. He was a realized soul. I'm sure he would have been very fond of reading the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> Unfortunately, he didn't get the Bhagavad Gita. But yeah, this is, uh, this is what people need to learn about, that you don't die. You're eternal. Nobody wants to die. Why? Why is it no one wants to die? Because we don't. Nainam chindanti sastrani, nainam tiyati pavaka, na chai nam kalajantya, no sochiti marud. You can't be uh, destroyed by any weapon, you can't be burned, 
can't drown the soul. Uh, so the soul is very powerful. And the reason the soul is so powerful is because it's part and parcel of the Supreme, most powerful, Krishna. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is real education, king of education, and it's the most secret, most secret of all secrets. And one may ask, well, how is it such a, a great secret? Because we've distributed millions of these actually over 500 million, about 520 million books around the world. Yeah. Not exactly Bhagavad Gita. We, I'm sure we distributed many millions of Bhagavad Gitas, but all of Prabhupada's books, over half a billion. So one may ask, well, how is it such a secret then? Well, one may have the book, like many, even many devotees I spoke to, they said the read the Bible, you couldn't understand anything. <laughs> but then they read it again, and uh, then then they understood. Quite often, devotees have told me that. And what to speak of people out there that they get the book can't understand. So in that sense, it's a secret. They may have it, they may read it, but still not to understand. And I've been reading it for 42 years and still it's, it's not easy. It's not an easy subject matter to understand. Uh, and what is the essence of the Bhagavad Gita? Very few understand. Many scholars didn't understand the essence or the 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 goal of the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. There was even one person, he was commenting, he was a scholar, and he, was, he gave a translation and commentary. And in this verse, Haradamam Parachyadja, in his commentary, he says, Krishna is asking for too much. This commentary <laughs> of someone who didn't understand the Bhagavad Gita. He didn't understand that if you surrender to Krishna, then you get Krishna. Yeah. So he's saying you're asking for too much, but actually, if one does surrender to Krishna, you come out a big winner. You come out way ahead because you get Krishna. I guess because he had so many material attachments, you know, to surrender completely everything to Krishna was just too much. So, actually Prabhupada said that the ninth chapter is a, is a chapter of, re, of renunciation for sannyasis. So it's, uh, it's meant to help us become more and more detached from that which we're too much attached to, you know, this material body, the material world, sense gratification, so many things that we're attached to. But the more we become detached from these things, and the more we become attached to Krishna, then we understand the secret message of Krishna that's given in the Bhagavad Gita. And the, yeah, the the essence actually is that that verse, Sarvadharma Prachaja, abandon all varieties of religion, just surrender to me. All free from all sin for reaction. Do not fear. So yeah, this is the, the goal of uh, reading Bhagavad Gita is to surrender completely to Krishna. And then we'll be uh, satisfied. So continuing with this purport, as far as ordinary education is concerned, people are involved with many departments, politics, sociology, physics, chemistry, mathematics, astronomy, 
engineering, etc. There are so many departments of knowledge all over the world and many huge universities, but there is unfortunately no university or educational institution where the science of the spirit soul is instructed. Yet the soul is the most important part of the body. Without the presence of the soul, the body has no value. Still people are placing great stress on the bodily necessities of life, not caring for the vital soul. Uh, just like there's so many important people on the planet now. Like there's so many prime ministers, there's presidents, there's kings, there's queens. But that's only as long as the soul is within the body. And there's so many beautiful people. You know, Miss America, Mr. Universe, you know, big, strong, very attractive. But as soon as the soul leaves the body, it's not attractive anymore. You know, at all. So it's the soul that is most attractive, especially for a pure soul. It's like Prabhupada, so pure, therefore you're so attractive. Tens of thousands of pictures of Prabhupada. And beautiful. Yeah, I remember I was showing a book to one lady. She saw the picture of Prabhupada and she said, oh, he's a cutie. <laughs> he's attractive because he's pure. There's one instance of uh, Jamuna. You read this book by Jamuna? Amazing. Amazing book. You got to read it. So she was uh, there in India and they, he was in one room and she was in the, the next room, you know, separated apartments. And they were, she was on the balcony and there were, he was on the balcony and they were, they were I'm not sure which, exactly which city. So they were talking and then she said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I love you. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, I know. And then he walked back into his room. <laughs> Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> Just to give you a little, another little insight into the nature of this book. You know, at one point, Prabhupada was staying at John Lennon's estate, Tittenhurst. And she was there, along with her husband, uh, Guru Das. And there was, some, there was about 15 devotees staying there. They were uh, renovating the house and doing work there and they, were, they had no place to stay so they were staying there and she was walking with Prabhupada and Gurudas is filming this and she's not walking next to Prabhupada and they're, they're chanting and she thought better I, I, I walk behind Prabhupada my guru I'm following his footsteps. So she's walking behind Prabhupada. And she just happens to look down and there was dew on the grass. But she looked down and she's noticed that there's no footprint. That's right, no footprint. And she's a sharp lady. So she's like, He's not, he's floating, he's not leaving a footprint. Many devotees had this experience that Prabhupada was floating. You know, he's not walking, he's floating. But she was walking right behind Prabhupada. And you would think there'd be a footprint. <laughs> There's no footprint. So she said, Prabhupada, you're not leaving a footprint. And Prabhupada just kind of turned around and said, you'll understand in the future. And then just kept floating. <laughs> <Is he okay? laughs> so this is a little nectar from that book. It's incredible. She was, she was such a, she was like our Queen Kunti of Iskon, such a, such a saintly lady. So, 
the more we connect to Krishna, the more we realize, actually I'm a spirit soul. I'm a very, very small entity in this, in this gross body. And the more we realize this, that we're actually soul within the body, the more we can actually enter into devotional service. Prabhupada, many times he said that devotional service begins when we realize souls. Yeah. Of course, there's, there's devotional service in the mode of ignorance, the mode of, devotional service in the mode of passion, devotional service in the mode of good. That's also there. But real devotional service begins when, we're, when we realize I'm a soul, I'm part of Krishna. You know, and then gradually it, it increases and increases. You know, so whatever can, can help us come to this understanding that I'm the soul, and this is one of the, the benefits of chanting also. Chanting Hare Krishna, this is one of the benefits that you be eventually become realized that I'm, I'm not this body, I'm the soul. Many benefits of chanting Hare Krishna. So this is uh, one of them, one of the major benefits of chanting the holy name of Krishna. So Prabhupada goes on to say, the Bhagavad Gita, especially from the second chapter on, stresses the importance of the soul. In the very beginning, the Lord says that this body is perishable and that the soul is not perishable. Antavanta ime deha nityasyokta sarirana. That is a confidential part of knowledge. Simply knowing that the spirit soul is different from this body and that its nature is immutable, indestructible, and eternal. But that gives no positive information about the soul. Sometimes people are under the impression that the soul is different from the body and that when the body is finished or one is liberated from the body, the soul remains in a void and becomes impersonal. Such a, that's, that, that seems like such a, a boring life, you know. <laughs> so it's like, they, you know, that's the Brahma Jyoti, it's spirit souls. But there's no variety. Yeah. There's no variety. Just like imagine you're on this planet alone. No one to associate with. You can't converse with anybody. It'd, very, it'd be very boring. Yeah. So... Therefore, the living entities, gradually, eventually they come down desiring bliss. There's no bliss. There's no variety. There's no bliss. They come down again. It's possible to, to go up also, but generally not. But the, the nature of the soul is eternality. That's there. They understand they're eternal. There's knowledge. There's there. But there's no bliss. So they come down. But in, uh, in this process of bhakti, they're all there. The knowledge is there. The eternality is and the bliss is there. But actually, that is not the fact. How can the soul, which is so active within this body, be inactive after being liberated from the body? It is always active. If it is eternal, then it is eternally active. And its activities in the spiritual kingdom are the most confidential part of spiritual knowledge. Hmm. The activities in the spiritual kingdom are the most confidential part of spiritual knowledge. So one has a spiritual body in the spiritual world and one has interaction with Krishna in the spiritual world, in different varieties of relationships. 
So it's interesting here that actually there's one purport Prabhupada says that in the spiritual world everything is animate. In this world most things are inanimate. You know, gross matter, dead matter. In the spiritual world everything is animate. Everything moves. Everything is alive. I was just listening to one class, I think it was was it in the Union song, but that even Krishna's earrings are alive. <laughs> Everything is alive. <clears throat> Everything moves. Remember when we were children, we'd see you know, cartoons where the houses are speaking and moving around. So <laughs> I think I got that from that. So everything moves, everything sees, everything speaks. Everything is personal. Amazing. <laughs> it's like very attractive. And in the spiritual world, is, you know, there's a copper viksha tree. Is whatever you want, you can get from a copper viksha tree. You know, like here in this world, is, everything is very limited. The spiritual world, you have, also there's 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 there's, there's uh, uh, chintamani gems. You can get whatever you want from chintamani gem as well. So it's a very attractive place, the spiritual, a high-class neighborhood. <laughs> and everyone there is a pure devotee. It's like there's many devotees in our Iskand society, they're very nice. But imagine everybody is a pure devotee, everybody is absorbed in serving Krishna, thinking of Krishna, serving Krishna, serving each other. In the spiritual world, everything is about service, everybody is completely selfless. Here in this world, everybody is selfish. Complete opposite. In this, everybody is completely selfless. And what is most attractive about the spiritual world is Krishna. Krishna is there. It wouldn't be attractive if Krishna wasn't there. Yeah. Although everything is so many attractive things, but without Krishna. Yeah. Just like when Krishna was in Vrindavan. When Krishna was here in Vrindavan, he was leaving. And it was just like, the gopis were just like, they were just, they were tormented. Just the thought of Krishna leaving Vrindavan. Vrindavan is beautiful. Yeah. But just the thought, it was just, it was just, the worst thought <laughs> that, that could come is that Krishna's leaving. So, yeah, this is what is most attractive in the spiritual world. Because Krishna is all attractive. These activities of the spirit soul are therefore indicated here as continuing or constituting the king of all knowledge, the most confidential part of knowledge. This knowledge is the purest form of all activities, as explained in the Vedic literature. Therefore, the Krishna, he says, Vedyam Pavitram Omkara. I am the goal of the Vedas. I am that which purifies. Uh, uh, Vedyam Pavitram. Pavitram means pure. So Krishna is so pure. We can't imagine of how. It's like the living entity, the soul is also pure, but we have the, we, we're prone to, we can fall down. But Krishna, it's not like that. Just like there's a very nice verse in the Bhagavad Gita, which Krishna says, this is how you should think of me. Kavim pranam anushasataram anor anuyungsam nusprejya sarvashidataram achinchirupam adityaranam tamasaparashtha. This is how we should think of Krishna. As he who knows everything. That's God, that's Krishna. He knows everything. He's the oldest person. Of course, we're all old, but yeah, the soul is eternal. But Krishna, he's the foremost, <laughs> oldest. <laughs> it's like we have grandpas. <laughs> so great, 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 great. The oldest amongst the eternals. Kaving pranam anushasataram that he is the supreme controller. We can control a little bit. Krishna, he controls everything. 
Param Ishvara. He is the control of everything. Nothing moves without the, without the sanction of Krishna. Just like we have this this uh, this uh, virus you know, going town to town, village to village, house to house. <laughs> but it's under the control. Nothing moves without the sanction of Krishna. So even these these diseases that come, these viruses, pandemic, these are also under the control of Krishna. Nothing moves without the sanction of Krishna. So he's in control of this as well. It's like there is uh, this instance of such a great devotee, Prahlad Maharaj, tried to kill him in so many ways, but he couldn't be killed. They tried to poison him, deadly poison. He ate it, no problem. And Harani Kasipu, he became so frustrated, he couldn't kill him in any way, tried to throw him off a cliff, he'd be caught somehow, he'd survive. He tried to you know, throw him in a pit of snakes, tried to throw him in burning oil. It's a, Rakhi Krishna Mori K, Mori Krishna Rakhi. If Krishna wants to kill someone, no one can save him. If Krishna wants to protect someone, no one can kill him. So this is Krishna, he's the supreme Param Ishvara. Yeah. So, so he's the supreme controller. Kavin Pranam Anusasatan Anur Anyanksan Anishmaraya. He's smaller than the smallest. He's bigger than the biggest. Krishna is so small. He can go on a long walk in the atom. <laughs> he's very small. He's and he's big. He's like there's the, the Mahavishnu. Yeah. There's universes coming out of the pores of his body. Sometimes it seems out of out of his breath and sometimes out of the pores. Of, but anyway, it's big, you know. And this is a small universe. Our Brahma only has four heads. Yeah. Some of them have millions. <laughs> it's like one of those a chincha you can see. Oh. So there's some big universes out there, and they're all coming from Mahavishnu, who is an expansion of Krishna. So Krishna's big. He's big time. Kavin pranam anusasataram anor anuyangsan usmreya sarvashidataram achincha rupam that he's maintaining everyone. He's, he's even, he's so kind. He's maintaining even the atheist. These rascals out there, they're trying to prove there's no God. He's even maintaining them. He's so benevolent. Yeah. And his form is inconceivable. And he has an inconceivable amount of form. It's described, there's so many forms of Krishna just like the waves of the ocean, just like we have the ocean here, there's so many waves. So there's so many waves, there's so many incarnations of Krishna. And then uh, the last line, Adityavaranam, that Krishna, he's, he's brilliant like the sun. He's brilliant like the sun. It's like there's one, I think it's in the Ishopani said, that please Krishna remove this glaring effulgence so I can see your form. Only by Krishna's mercy can we see his form. Because this Brahma Jyoti is an in it, in it. expansion of Krishna. It's emanating from Krishna. And this sun is just an expansion of the, or a reflection of the Brahma Jyoti. So it's very effulgent. And he cannot be overcome by ignorance like us. He cannot be overcome by the modes of nature. He creates, he's, the, the modes of nature are under his control. So, this is Krishna. In the Padma Purana, man's sinful activities have been analyzed and are shown to be the results of sin after sin. Those who are engaged in fruitive activities are entangled in different stages and forms of sinful reactions. For instance, when the seed of a particular tree is sown, the tree 
does not appear immediately to grow. It takes some time. It is first a small sprouting plant, then it assumes the form of a tree, then it flowers and bears fruit, and when it is complete, the flowers and fruits are enjoyed by persons who have sown the seed of the tree. Similarly, a man performs a sinful act, and like a seed, it takes time to fructify. There are different stages. The sinful action may have already stopped with the in, within the individual, but the results or the fruit of that sinful action are still to be enjoyed. There are sins which are still in the form of a seed, and there are others which are already fructified and are giving us fruit, which we are enjoying as distress and pain. As explained in the 28th verse of the 7th chapter, a person who has completely ended the reactions of all sinful activities and who is fully engaged in pious activities being freed from the duality of this material world becomes engaged in devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. In other words, those who are actually engaged in the devotional service of the Supreme Lord are already freed from all reactions. This statement is confirmed in the Padma Purana. A pra- no, better, it's hard to read. With. For those who are engaged in the devotional service of the Supreme Personality of God, in all sinful reactions, whether fructified in the stock or in the form of a seed, gradually vanish. Therefore, the purifying potency of devotional service is very strong and is called pavitram uttamam, the purest. Uttama means transcendental. Tamas means this material world or darkness. And uttama means that which is transcendental to material activities. Devotional activities are never to be considered material, although sometimes it appears that devotees are engaged just like ordinary men. One who can see and is familiar with devotional service will know that they are not material activities. They are all spiritual and devotional, uncontaminated by the material modes of nature. It is said that the execution of devotional service is so perfect that one can perceive the results directly. This direct result is actually perceived. And we can have practical experience that any person who is chanting the holy names of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, in course of chanting without offenses, feels some transcendental pleasure and very quickly becomes purified of all material contamination. Now, when we're chanting, as it said here, there's offenses that we have to avoid. Now, the, the two that I've found are most, mostly committed is, is, is chanting inattentively and maintaining material attachments, even after understanding so many instructions on this matter. Now, Vishnu Jana was a... Uh, Vishnu Jana Maharaj, he gave an example that imagine you're in a city, big city, say Los Angeles, and you're in an area where there's a lot of crime. You know, you, someone lives, let's say they have a house in an area where there's a lot of crime. And they have valuable things in their house. You know, TV, furniture, computer, you know, valuable things. And they leave their door open all night long in a crime-ridden area. Now, the chances of those valuable things being in there in the morning are pretty slim. (laughs) So he said, if we chant our rounds 
then this means the doors are closed. If we don't chant our rounds, then the doors are wide open and Maya will come and just, whatever bhakti is there, it'll be taken away. Right? Nice example. Now, let's say the doors are closed, but the windows are open. <laughs> Still there's opportunity. So the windows open as compared to inattentive. Maya can still move in. And whatever bhakti, whatever desire we have to serve Krishna can be taken away if we continue this inattentive chanting. And there's, I don't know if you've heard this before, but uh, Bhakti Tirtha Swami had a very nice way to, to get back on track to chanting attentive java. If he was chanting and you found he was inattentive, he would stop and back up one or two beats, yeah, just to check the mind. Otherwise, he just keeps going. You know, the mind just keeps going. It's, I mean, uh, I've had the experience to chant a whole round and not hear one mantra. Maybe you had that experience. <laughs> the mind is such a rascal. So, to catch the mind, actually, Bhakti Siddhanta says what he said, the mind's a rascal. And therefore, that's why it's hard to chant attentively. It's hard to hear. Sometimes they read a whole page and nothing, nothing sank. You know, the mind is somewhere else. The mind is just, it's interested in sense gratification. You know, it's not interested in surrendering. It wants to enjoy. You know. So we had to put the mind in the, in the right direction. And sometimes you got to preach to the mind. Listen, mind, I know you want to enjoy, but listen, there's no pleasure in this world. If you surrender to Krishna, you're going to get so much pleasure. Remember those great devotees, you know, Rupa Goswami, you know, he's, he's experienced so much pleasure, you know, you know, the hairs are standing, so there's a lot of pleasure there, you know. <laughs> you just surrender to Krishna, you've got to kind of preach to the mind. So continuing this purport, this is actually seen, furthermore, if one engages not only in hearing, but in trying to broadcast the message of devotional service as well, or if he engages himself in helping the missionary activities of Christian consciousness, he gradually feels spiritual progress. I can tell you, my, personally, my most ecstatic times in this life have been on book distribution, just to confirm this. <laughs> This advancement in spiritual life does not depend on any kind of previous education or qualification. Proof of that is all of us here in the Hare Krishna movement. The method itself is so pure that by simply engaging in it, one becomes pure. In the Vedanta Sutra, this is also described in the following words. Devotional service is so potent that simply by engaging in the activities of devotional service, one becomes enlightened without a doubt. A practical example of this can be seen in the previous life of Narada, who, in that life, happened to be the son of a maidservant. He had no education, nor was he born into a high family. Sounds similar to us, huh? <laughs> but, when his mother was engaged in serving great devotees, Narada also became engaged. And sometimes, in the absence of his mother, he would serve the great devotees himself. Narada Muni personally says, quote, well, I see this is uh, 1525. In this verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, Narada describes his previous life to his disciple Vyasadeva. He says that while engaged as a boy servant for these purified devotees during the four months of their stay, he was intimately associating with them. Sometimes these sages left remnants of food on their dishes and the boy who would wash the dishes wanted to taste the remnants. So he asked, he was so humble, he didn't just take, he asked him. Interesting. 
So he asked the great devotees for their permission. And when they gave it, Narada ate those remnants and consequently became freed from all sinful reactions. As he went on eating, he gradually became a pure, as, as pure-hearted as the sages. So it sounds like he was, uh, every day he was getting the remnants. The great devotees relished the taste of unceasing devotional service to the Lord by hearing and chanting, and Narada gradually developed the same taste. Narada further says, by associating with the sages, he got the, I got the, the taste for hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, and developed a great desire for devotional service. Therefore, as described in the Vedanta Sutra, if one is engaged simply in the acts of devotional service, everything is revealed to him automatically, and he can understand. This is called pratyaksha, directly perceived. The word dharma means the path of religion. Narada was actually a son of a maidservant. He had no opportunity to go to school. He was simply assisting his mother. And fortunately, his mother rendered some service to the devotees. The child Narada also got the opportunity and simply by, associate, by association achieved the highest goal of all religion. The highest goal of all religion is devotional service, as stated in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Savai Pungsam Pro Dharma Yato Bhakti Hoksa Religious people generally do not know that the highest perfection of religion is the attainment of devotional service, as we have already discussed in regard to the last verse of chapter 8. Generally, Vedic knowledge is required for self-realization, but here, although Narada never went to, to the school of the spiritual master and was not educated in the Vedic principles, he acquired the highest result of Vedic study. This process is so potent that even without performing the religious process regularly, one can be raised to the highest perfection. How is this possible? This is also confirmed in the Vedic literature. One who is in association with great acharyas, even if he is not educated or has never studied the Vedas, can become familiar with all the knowledge necessary for realization. The process of devotional service is a very happy one. Why? Devotional service consists of Shav Shavaram Kirtan Vishnu. So one can simply hear the chanting of the glories of the Lord or he can attend philosophical lectures on transcendental knowledge given by authorized acharyas simply by sitting one can learn. Then one can eat the remnants of the food offered to God. Nice, palatable dishes in every state. Devotional service is joyful. Jivabhadi. Yay. Viva. Oh, isn't that nice? <laughs>